be small, much as we know that there are always few ladies in silence. And uh, that was an initiative for my mother and daughter, from the US Embassy. Uh, and uh, we are happy to come to this program. Professor Kawa is in charge of the, the seminars and the department. Okay. So we would like also to uh, see how we can do this. Before it was launched to Mars, this is at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. 
California in the United States. And just to give you an idea of its size, here's a couple of people standing here. So you can see it's fairly tall. It's about two meters tall and about the size of a small car. And it's got six wheels, three on each side, since obviously there's no roads on Mars, so it's got to make its own way as it goes over the terrain. And it makes its mark here. You can see this is a big sand dune it drove over. You can see the tracks as it traveled over the dune and headed down this rocky road here. And you can look back at the picture. And you can just see a lot of the diversity here. You've got a sand dune, you've got a rock plane here, you've got these huge rocks, which the rover is always trying to avoid. And all of these, the geologists are trying to study to figure out what's going on here on Mars. Here's like the rich vein features here. These are very bright veins that they're trying to figure out what it's made of. They're trying to look for evidence that there may have been water at some point on Mars, because Mars could have been a place where it could have supported life. The, the rover itself is not looking for signatures of life. It really wasn't designed to. It was more trying to look for the environment in which life could have formed. And in that aspect, it has been successful. <clears throat> One of the more interesting things about the rover is it has this arm that folds out, reaches again about two meters out in front of it. You can see the arm here. It stretches out from the rover. There's kind of this elbow. And then on the end, there's a turret here which has all different kinds of instruments. It's got something like a magnifying glass that can get within about two centimeters of an object, a rock, so they can really see up close uh, a lot of the detail. And it also has a drill on it. You can see the drill right here, drilling into the rock. And here's an example of a hole that it makes. It makes a hole about maybe eight centimeters deep, extracts some of the sample out of it, and puts it into an analyzer that's on inside the rover itself, kind of a gas chromatograph type thing where it can separate out all the elements that it has that it's uh, put inside there. So one of the more interesting things that's found is that you can see here kind of in red, and this isn't doesn't project very well, but we know that Mars is fairly red from all the iron oxide that it has. Um, it gives it its reddish hue. But as soon as you drill down beneath the surface here, the dirt and the soil that comes out here is very gray. So it doesn't have that red tint to it. So that's very interesting to the geologists to figure out, okay, what is going on that would make the surface red? And we know it's from oxidizing of iron, but then everything that's beneath it is this gray color, and so that's part of the analysis that they're currently doing. Okay, and finally, just to give kind of a sample here, it's hard to see here, unfortunately, but uh, just an example of the diversity of the scenery on Mars. These are 360 panoramas, and here in the black is the rover bed kind of cut out. They didn't take any pictures of that. But you can see in the top here, we've got this big sand dune feature, maybe some rocky fields here, big sand dune over here. And then it drove, drives on for several meters, and then all of a sudden now it's in this complete dune field. You can see the tracks of the rover as it drove in here. And even ahead of it, this is kind of in front, you can see it's just headed over more dunes. As it drives on, now all the dunes are gone, maybe just a little sand dune right here. But now it's mostly on this rocky bed. And so they're always trying to figure out where are these features coming, coming from. And that's one of the key areas for planetary geologists. Okay, leaving the planets for the moment. What other things can astronomers study in the solar system? Well, we have comets and asteroids. Now, a comet, and this is a classical picture of a comet here, is an icy dirt ball. So it's essentially mostly made of water ice with a lot of dust and dirt mixed into it. So, comets are in orbit around the sun. Some are locked in fairly circular orbits. These are kind of short period comets that come through every once in a while. Fairly common. But every once in a while, we get to what's called long period comets. They are in a highly elliptical orbit that may take thousands of years, or maybe even one pass is all they're going to make around the sun. And as they get close to the sun, maybe around the orbit of Mars, all that water that's inside the comet begins to violently blow off. Right? All that water sublimates, and with it, it extracts a lot of the dirt that's inside the comet. And so that's why you get this huge dust veil that's behind. So the nucleus itself is this tiny little dot, even tinier than that red dot there in the center of the uh, dust cloud called the coma. And as that water goes off, it takes all that dust, and the comet is moving on, and all of the radiation particles from the sun are blowing the dust away as well, and so you get this nice tail. These, this is the type of thing that I study. 
This is my area of expertise. I study the dust in comets. So what makes the comets so interesting? Well, they were formed very early on in the history of our solar system, even before the planets. And so they're time capsules of the conditions and the materials that existed in our solar system just prior to the formation of planets. And so that way they have information that we can say, okay, we know what our solar nebula was made of, and depending on the type of minerals we see inside, we know what conditions, whether they're having large amounts of mixing materials, since comets had to form very far out to get all that ice. We know that a lot of material had to be heated, so it was heated close to the sun, and then somehow transported out to comets. And so that way then all the solar nebula modelers can go back and have to put that in their computer models and try to figure out how planets could have formed. So that's why they're interesting to me. <coughs> Excuse me. So when it's shown here, this is a uh, close-up of the comet nucleus. So this is that little thing right in the middle there. You can see it's very, it's got all these features to it. They're not nice little town balls. Um, this one's got to be you know, kind of the oldest end to it. They're not very big. This is about five kilometers across. Some can be very big. For example, this comet here is a Bob in it, it would be 30 kilometers across, but you're really not going to get anything much bigger than that. You can see a lot of features here, and a lot of these are due to vents, like this is a big vent of where a lot of that water is just boiling off and escaping and taking all of that material from deep below the surface out. And here's like a huge vent over here. So it's a very diverse, very interesting uh, surface to these things. That's opposed to an asteroid, so this is a picture of an asteroid up here. You can see it's very smooth. Now what makes an asteroid different from a comet is that asteroids don't have all that water ice inside it. They are essentially just a big rock orbiting in space. Now they also form early on in the solar system, so they're still very interesting objects to study, but they're a little more difficult to study since they're not ejecting all of that nice material out to make this big dusty cone. But they are big rocks that are still interesting. You can see there's still some pitting here, possibly from collisions of little smaller uh, objects and smaller asteroids that may fit it. But they're a lot smoother compared to the surface of the continent. Okay, what else do we have in our solar system? Well, obviously the biggest thing in our solar system, which is the sun. So now when we see the sun, we kind of look at it, which we shouldn't stare at it, of course, but we know it looks like kind of this big bright disk. But as you start to image it, you see there's a lot of diversity here, even just on the surface of the sun itself. You've got these bright areas, which are indicators of very hot regions of the star. You can see all this modeling, you the convection cells that are working on the sun as energy is kind of bubbling. Think of it as like a boiling effect. You've got all these jets here. These are kind of solar flares that are protruding out. There's a nice solar flare right here. So there's a whole area of astronomers that do nothing but study the sun. I mean, there's so much physics going on here because it's a big nuclear vacuum. It's turning hydrogen and helium, and then it's got all these physics as it's transporting all that heat and energy from its core out to the surface. So I'm going to show a little movie here. This goes fairly quick, but this disk right here is blocking out the brightest portion of the sun. So we can see a lot of the material that's being blown off, high energy particles, those are composed of protons. So you can see just all the amount of stuff that blows off here. And here we'll see a big explosion. So that was just a massive outburst from the sun itself. And we get these all the time. And every once in a while, you'll hear about a big solar flare heading towards Earth, which will protect us because we have our nice magnetic field that will protect us from these high energy particles. But any satellites, the communication satellites that are being well, out at the surface or outside of our magnetic field might get fried a little bit. And we have lost a few that way. I want to play this again a couple of times because there's also something of interest here. Maybe you notice these two little objects right here heading right into the sun. Those are called sun raising comets. And so those poor little guys got captured and actually they were not in a nice orbit around the sun. They were captured by the sun and went in and died a huge fiery death. So Again, there's a whole aspect of astronomers who study nothing but these sun grazing comets. What makes them interesting is you're not only just seeing all the nice gas and dust that's blowing out of it. These things are at the end of their life and they're in such an intense radiation field, they're just getting hit ripped apart and just all that material is going to come out and burst. So you've got to be quick. And usually 
ideally they know when something's going to be captured. But yeah, these two are just at the end of their lives and just kind of blow apart. So sun rays and comets is a whole other area of study. Okay, let's leave the solar system here and go to the next really common object that's in our universe, and that's just typical stars. And a lot of people do nothing but study stars. And they're interesting in the fact that they are physics factories, like I said. They're converting their nuclear reactors that are fusing materials together, and they do have an interesting lifetime, they vary in activity, and there's all different sorts of types. We have kind of the coolest one here, which is an M-type star. It's, they're generally pretty cool, so they're kind of reddish, and uh, they're fairly common around. And then we have the G-types, which is what our sun is. Our sun is a G-type star, a fairly average star, which is great for us, not too hot, not too cold. Then we go all the way up to these huge O-type stars, and these things are massive, just huge factories building all sorts of materials. So, Let's just take a look at their lifetimes here, or their life cycles. So, every star starts off in the stellar nebula, which is a collection of gas and dust, and we'll talk more about the stellar nebula in a second. But just all you need to know is out of kind of this loose collection of gas and dust, if at some point all that is going to start collecting together, and you're going to start building a star. And then roughly we can split it up into two categories here, an average type star and a massive star. So let's look at this average star, which is essentially like our star. And so this is going to be the life cycle of our sun. So it's happily burning, it's full of hydrogen, it's a big ball of hydrogen, and the gravity is so big down in its core, it's fusing that hydrogen and those protons together to make helium, and it's just happily going along. And most of stars basically spend most of their life burning this nuclear fuel. And our star is about halfway through its life, so we've got millions and millions of years sun dies, so we don't have to worry about anything that's going to happen to it anytime soon. But it's got plenty of fuel to burn on. But at some point, it's going to run out of fuel. It's going to run out of just these little hydrogen atoms and not be able to turn them into helium. And, or it's turned them into helium, but it's not big enough to turn helium into anything heavier. It would have to be more massive. So the nuclear brain starts to turn off. Then we get what's called red giant, because it's starting to cool and it's starting to expand. So that outer surface layer here, kind of the uh, atmosphere, is starting to expand more as it cools down until eventually it's going to turn off its nuclear burning altogether. And all these outer layers are going to be expelled into what's called a planetary nebula. Now, unfortunately, that's a confusing name. Planetary nebula, it has nothing to do with planets. There's no planets in here. It didn't come from a planet. I think early on, when astronomers were looking at these through their eyepieces, they thought they might have discovered more planets. But as we study these more, uh, astronomers realize that these were dust and gas clouds from dying stars. But the name, unfortunately, is still stuck. So we're stuck with the name planetary nebula. So there's no more burning going on here. You've got this hot ember in the middle here, which is just a collection of helium atoms that can't, that's not massive enough to start any more nuclear fusion. And then you've got the rest of these outer layers that are being sloughed off, and just gas and dust is being pushed out into galaxy. Then eventually the gas and dust will dissipate and you're just left with the uh, collection of helium atoms and they, it's called a white dwarf. And think of it as just a dying ember from what used to be a very intense fire. And eventually that will fade out over millions and billions of years until it just becomes a cold rock. Okay, that's going to be the fate of our star. And there's all sorts of objects that we can study along this life cycle to, to understand the physics more. If we follow now the life cycle of the massive star, like the O star, this is a huge star, it's doing the same thing. It's burning the nuclear fuel. It can make more elements, though. It can start burning helium, lithium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, up to like iron. And so even though it's massive and it's creating all of these materials, the bigger stars tend to burn faster. So it's going to extinguish its lifestyle. But we're talking comparatively faster. Instead of many, many millions of years, maybe it's a few million years. But it's going to do the same thing. As it starts running out of material, it will become what's called a red supergiant. So again, it's starting to cool, and that outer layers are starting to expand. But what's different is once it actually nuclear burning ceases, all that material, since 
the gravitational attraction is so strong, essentially all that material is going to be try to suck down into the center all at once. And it collapses and almost it's like a bouncing effect. And it explodes violently into the galaxy and it's called a supernova. And the energy from a supernova is massive. I mean, we can see supernova in other galaxies that are so bright. You'll be looking at a galaxy one day and all of a sudden, boom, this huge light blinks on. And we know it's a supernova. And everybody calls, everybody else, we got a supernova, we got a supernova. And everybody turns and looks at it because they're really interested in what happens during the early lifetimes of a supernova. All this gas is being ejected and then gas will eventually dissipate and you'll start creating all this dust and uh, all sorts of fascinating things. So again, it's going to be violently populating the um, galaxy with all this gas and dust. And then based on its size, it's going to end its life in one of two ways. It's either in the center, just going to be left a ball of neutrons, known as a neutron star. And these things tend to rotate very quickly and many gamma rays, and that's how we can kind of identify them. Or if it's truly massive, that ball of neutrons will collapse down into a singularity, and it's known as a black hole. So this is obviously an artist's conception, because they wanted to show a black hole instead of just putting a black dot, which is pretty boring. And we know black holes are so massive that not even light can escape from it. There's a certain radius called the event horizon at which light cannot escape, and if you go inside the event horizon, you can never escape the gravitational pull. And how astronomers deduce the existence of a black hole is they look at the amount of material, you know, material may be rotating around it at a certain speed and a certain mass, and they know what the mass is of that thing is in the middle, and they're saying, okay, based on the radius or the material, it's got to be massive enough to be a black hole. Okay, so we now know that stars during their lifetimes, as they die, are actually repopulating the galaxy with gas and dust, either as a planetary nebula or as a supernova. So you've got all this gas and dust kind of swirling around the galaxy. Well, it's going to collect into these dust clouds. And uh, here's an example of the dust clouds. This is an actual picture from the Hubble Pick Space Telescope, which was launched, I think, on this day back in 1990, if I read the newspaper correctly today. Um, these are gas clouds. These are clouds of gas and dust. And each side, inside each one of these, you can see these little kind of wisps right here coming out. If we could see inside this dust cloud, we would see these stars actually being born. So these are known as like stellar nurseries because something either passed by, some sort of soup, uh, supernova shock wave, or maybe a star passing by that created some sort of density that was able to survive and actually start collecting all the material around it. And so it starts eating everything around it and it starts sucking everything in. And at some point, it's going to build some sort of bright object here in the star. And based on the angular momentum of all the material that's coming in as it's starting to rotate and starting to do, uh, basically eat everything around it, it's going to have this disk of material that starts to rotate around it itself. It's this material of gas and dust, out of which will eventually form all the comets and asteroids and planets, etc. So it's important to. Uh, it, it, it's a life cycle that is continuously replenishing itself. And so even many of the stars that we see in our galaxy were not here originally from the origin of the universe. There were several cycles already of stars living and dying and repopulating and building new ones all the time. Okay, so if we know that we've got all these stars that are being born, and we know that they have these planetary disks around them, out of which can form all these planets, are there other planets besides those that we know of in our solar system? And up to about maybe 15, 20 years ago, we would have said, no, the only planets that we know of are our own. Well, that's changed recently in that, especially the Kepler mission, which has found over seven or 800 different candidates, and I think a couple hundred of those have been confirmed, we actually have found many, many planets around other stars in our galaxy. Now, many of those star planets are not horribly interesting just because we know they can't control life. They're maybe uh, around closer to the sun than Mercury is, they may be larger than Jupiter, and so we know they're very big, they're very hot, but astronomers are always trying to find those planets which are what are called habitable zone. Now obviously this, our Earth is 
right in the smack dab center of what we call the habitable zone. So if we look at our sun, and if we were looking at a star about the same mass as our sun, we say, okay, any planet that's in closer than, say, about here, this would be like Mercury and Venus, they're in too close. And so any water that they would have, and really water is the key ingredient you're looking for, or you want to have liquid water, or the ability to have liquid water, these are too hot, and so you wouldn't be able to to uh, you boil off all your water. And so these are well outside the habitable zone. Getting a little bit farther out, obviously the gas giant planets are way too far out and way too cold, so you're always going to have ice. But our sphere right on the edge, and even then it's pretty cold out there. So if you're looking at a star that maybe is larger in mass, you can say, okay, well, as long as the planet maybe a little bit farther out here, you know, it could be in the uh, orbit of Mars which again would be right on the edge for this type of massive star, it could be in the habitable zone, the ability to have liquid water. Or maybe you've got a cooler star, a little bit smaller, so you can move the habitable zone in smaller. So the fact is that yes, they have found many planets that are populating that habitable zone. Now for comparison here, here's the size of the Earth. So we know we can stand on Earth. Unfortunately, if we even know this, a planet like this, or even this, or even this, they may be in an habitable zone, but they're pretty big as well. So we would have a hard time traveling to that planet and even trying to stand up on it. So even then, maybe there's life there, and maybe intelligent life developed. If so, they're probably big and burly and pretty scary. So we would mostly want to, we're mostly interested in things you know, that might be Earth-sized, say this one, or this one. And so the key is, is that, okay, we found all these habitable planets, and these possibly could have life on them. The next thing is now to actually try to image these and look for signatures of life, like oxygen, nitrogen, methane, things that we know that even plant life, plant life give off, and we would find in the atmosphere that may not occur uh, naturally unless you have life. So that's another key area that astronomers are always trying to study. Okay, leaving exoplanets for the moment, let's talk about galaxies. So we know that stars are in collections of uh, bodies that we know as galaxies, and there are billions of galaxies in the universe. Well, they also come in many different shapes and sizes. And this is almost like an evolutionary track here, at least some believe. We've got the elliptical galaxies here. Now, these, even though they look like fuzzy dots, are actually populated with billions of stars, but they also have a lot of gas and dust between those stars. And the gas and dust is what gives it this real fuzzy look. And as we know, out of the gas and dust come more stars. And so these may be early uh, galaxies that are forming with a lot of gas and dust that still need to be populated with more stars. And then there's just different sizes from circular to kind of side here. Then it breaks off into kind of two branches here. This is the S branch, or known as the spiral branch. So they're uh, marked by these spiral arms. And it's these spiral arms where now the gas and dust gives them these spiral looks. So inside each of these arms is where all your most of your star formation is going to occur. So we can see we've got a nice spiral here, and then on this other branch, we've got what's called the SD stars, and these are the barred spirals. So you can see a nice bar going down the middle here as well with the arms. And these, again, this bar may have implications for where stars are actually being formed inside this galaxy. And then we end up with these irregular galaxies, which really don't correspond to anything, but they do have kind of bright features here as well, uh, where all the gas and dust is. So, our galaxy, and this is just an artist's conception of our galaxy since we can't really take a picture of it, is just kind of a regular spiral type galaxy here. And we live somewhere like over here in one of the arms of the galaxy, which is great because we're out of a busy neighborhood here, here in the center. Uh, it's also believed there may be a black hole in the center of our galaxy, so it's just best to stay out of that neighborhood. So we're happy here in our kind of little sparse neighborhood, right in one of the arms. And place to be because we, we're not bothered by things always floating through our solar system. Okay, finally, there's a whole area of astronomy called cosmology. 
and that's concerned with the origins of the universe. So, a cosmologist spent a lot of time trying to understand what actually went on during the first moments after the Big Bang, and then the quick cooling of the solar system, or sorry, quick cooling of the universe where particles were formed, and those particles collected into stars and galaxies, etc., etc. And so they're always trying to look back as far as possible to find the oldest objects, to look at the radiation, how the cosmic background radiation from the early part uh, after the Big Bang. And they're really concerned with what are the physics that go on that made the universe as we have it today. You know, why matter uh, instead of antimatter developed? Uh, what are the constants of the universe, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a whole rich, and mostly they do a lot of theoretical work. Some are doing some sort of observational work, but it's a huge area of study uh, for many astronomers. Okay, leaving the science for the moment, uh, let's just talk about what astronomers do. So this is the fun part of astronomy, actually going to an observatory. Now, not every astronomer is an observational astronomer. I am, I love going to the telescope. Some people are like, no, forget it, I'd rather just work on my theoretical models, which is great too. But uh, this is always the fun part in the, the, what attracted me to astronomy, was being able to go to an observatory this is the Big Island of Hawaii on the uh, extinct volcano Mauna Kea. And in each one of these domes is a telescope. And every night, you know, some group of scientists are up there on Mauna Kea trying to observe some or other object that they're interested in and they're trying to collect data on it. And so here we have, we can get the northern hemisphere sky here from the Big Island, but then we need to get all the stars from the southern hemisphere as well. So for example, here is the telescope here. Uh, down in Chile, on this mountain, Cerro Cachon, uh, down in, uh, in South America. And this is a twin, these two are twins here, these are called Gemini, this is Gemini North, and this is Gemini South. And I'll talk more about Gemini South here in a minute. We can also put, and put in them, and this is an actual picture, of a telescope in an airplane. Now, why would we want to put a telescope in an airplane? Well, we, of course, as humans, love to breathe, and we love our atmosphere. Astronomers hate the atmosphere. The atmosphere is always getting in the way. It's either turbulent, or it blocks radiation, and so the best thing that we can do, we go to high mountains as high as we can to get above. That's why we put telescopes on high mountains, to get as high in the, above the atmosphere as possible. But the plane is great because it can really get up there, get above like, like a good, fair amount of the atmosphere where we can get into certain wavelength regimes that you just can't reach from the ground. So that's why uh, an airplane is very useful. Satellites are another one. Satellites get way above the atmosphere, and so you don't have to worry about any atmosphere interference. Okay, so if I go to observatory, what does an astronomer do? Well, this is a picture of Crystal Lowell at Lowell Observatory in 1914. And here he is sitting in the dome looking through his telescope. Astronomers don't do that anymore. That's the old romantic days of astronomy where uh, you would sit in their really cold dome and they don't show it here, but you would probably have a pad of paper and you'd look through the telescope and kind of draw and you'd be like, see, see what I saw? And so, uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the old romantic astronomy. This is kind of more modern astronomy. Sitting in a nice temperature controlled control room, staring at computer monitor. It's still exciting. So this is myself and my uh, thesis advisor, Dr. Chick Woodward. This was back in 2005, actually. I can't believe this picture is 10 years old already. Uh, we're at the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility, which is one of the telescopes that was on Mauna Kea. And uh, this is essentially what you spend your night doing, is uh, looking at the data you're collecting on computers. So let me show you a telescope here. This is the uh, one I talked about, Gemini South. It's an eight meter diameter telescope. So the big primary mirror, the one that collects most of the light, is eight meters in diameter. And I'll give you a little sense of how big it is in a second. But uh, you can just get an idea of the size of this thing here. So the light comes down into the telescope, bounces off the primary mirror, up to the secondary, uh, secondary mirror at the top here. You can see that in the secondary mirror. Down to this tube, and then all of the scientific instruments are here at the bottom. Here we can get another look at it. Again, the mirror is about eight meters wide here, 
light comes down, bounces up here to the secondary, and then down in here is the instrument, either some sort of imager or spectrum. Okay, so here's a good picture of the mirror itself. This is eight meters in diameter, and you can't see it here, unfortunately. But that's me. I'm standing right here, and you can't, unfortunately, see it in this picture. So, you know, you can see how tall I am, and so now this gives you an idea of how really massive this telescope is and how big that mirror is. It's quite impressive. So you can see I was standing there during the daylight hours, and so once night fell, we went to the control room, and this is kind of a, your typical control room. You have banking computer monitors over here, and this is where the telescope operator sits. And so we'll tell them, okay, we want to point at so-and-so object, and they are the ones who actually rotate the dome, move the telescope, get the object, uh, point in the right direction. Then you've got a person over here who uses these monitors to run the instrument. They're the ones who are either going to take the picture or take the spectrum for you. And then you can't really see it here, but this is where I would sit, and so then they give me the data and I start my analysis. Okay, so this is kind of a basic, and this is what I was trying to show secondary students. So I'll walk through it here quickly because I think you guys have an idea of this. But I just wanted to give an example of what an astronomer does once they have the data, have some data to it. And this is kind of some of the stuff I do when I study the dust and comets, is that you take a spectrum and then you want to compare it with stuff maybe you've looked at in the laboratory. And so you can say, oh, I know this looks like silicate, I know this looks like carbon, I know this looks like iron. So this is just kind of a real quick example here, um, just showing, okay, if we have some sort of black body, like a star or something like that, something that emits energy at a nice, even rate, and we put it through something like a prism. And uh, some instruments have something. It's usually called a grating, where it's a refraction grating, where it's breaking up the light. You would get some sort of continuous spectrum here, something that you know, ranges from purple all the way to red. Uh, if you get something with gas, if you've got some sort of hot gas that's emitted, you know that if it's made up of certain atoms, only those atoms at certain wavelengths are going to be emitting. So you're not going to get a continuous spectrum. You're going to get lines emission lines of whatever uh, whatever atoms are in this hot gas. Okay, because we know gas or atoms only emit at certain wavelengths. Conversely, if we take our hot black body and then put a cool gas in front of it, as the light passes through the cool gas, atoms in that gas are going to absorb at those specific wavelengths. And then when you pass it through your prism, you get these dark lines, which are the absorption spectrum. So Let's say I'm at the telescope and I'm looking at this cool gas and it's got this nice, you know, hot source behind it and it's going through and I call it the spectrum that looks like this. So, and then I can say, okay, well I've got people who went to a lab and they've looked at these three different elements. And so I'm going to compare what I have here in my human zinc and sulfur lines and try to compare it to the absorption lines in my spectrum to see what is this cool gas that I'm looking at. So you can see, you can just start matching lines. I've got a line here, I've got a corresponding line there. I've got a nice line here, and a corresponding line here. So it's high likelihood that I've accumulated my cool gas. How about sink? I've got this doublet here. Yep, I've got it there. And there's this line here, it's right there. So that looks good. And then I've got this line here in green. And there's another absorption line there. And then you can't really see this paint one here, but that's that absorption right there. That looks good. So zinc is a good candidate. How about sulfur? I've got a green line here, but no green line here. So that's not looking good for sulfur. And similarly, I've got kind of this orange line here, but nothing up here. So I would say, OK, I looked at this cool gas. It looks like I have helium and zinc, but no sulfur. So you kind of, that's the kind of analysis you might do to, to really deduce what it is you're looking at. So I made scientific findings. So what do I do now? Well, this is what you spend most of your time doing, which is counting on a computer, maybe not that long, but you're spending your time writing papers because you want to communicate what you found in your ideas out to your colleagues, maybe out to everyone, and saying, here's an interesting thing I found. And there's all sorts of journals in which to publish. And some journals 
are very specific to their field. There's one called Icarus, which is mostly for planetary stuff. There's different cosmological ones. These are kind of the big three here. Astrophysical journal probably one of the biggest if you really want a wide, varied audience. Kind of everybody reads the astrophysical journal. But you've got other ones, astronomical journal, and astronomy, and astrophysics. And so you spend a lot of your time writing. If I can get to the telescope maybe two times a year for a couple days, that's great. I'm doing well. That's the fun part of the job, of course, getting to the observatory. But then once you do that, then you come back to your institution, sit in your office, and you're analyzing the data, writing programs, maybe building the physical models. And then once you are happy with your results, then you write it up so you can communicate your results to everyone. Maybe you go to a conference once or twice a year as well. OK, I'll just finish here with what astronomers don't do. Uh, first of all, I cannot tell you your horoscope. I can't predict your future, unfortunately, so this is not astrology, it's uh, astronomy. Uh, I don't have a special mind of space aliens. I don't know any space aliens, never met any space aliens. I don't think you've been visited by space aliens. Uh, personally, and this is not true of all astronomers, but this is just a personal one. I know many are in this boat as well. I have never memorized the constellations. Uh, some astronomers have, I haven't. You know, and it's embarrassing when somebody like, oh, you're an astronomer, what's that? And, you know, well, it's a bunch of stars that look like that. So, uh, it's okay not to have to know the constellations. So, I, I am happy with myself. Um, and as I said, we don't spend all our time looking through telescopes. Uh, I wish I spent more time looking through telescopes, but uh, as I said, that's the fun part of the job. But, you know, if you get to it a couple times a year, then that's great. Um, yeah, so I think that's basically it. And so thank you very much for your time, and I will take any questions. I've shocked you all. Either some were born very far out 
uh, beyond the orbit of Pluto. And they just kind of were born there, and that's where they live. And every once in a while, maybe they hit each other, or maybe some star goes by and disrupts them from their orbit, and they come and get captured. And then sometimes, this is just a gradual capturing, they become what's called short period comets. And so there's many comets in this family called short period comets that basically come around five, six years, every five to six years, we'll see them again. And it's just, we know them, they've, they've been here a long time, and they're just almost in a circular type orbit, much more circular, maybe kind of slight oval. Then there's this other subset of comets that were formed closer to where like Jupiter and Saturn were. And through gravitational interactions with Jupiter and Saturn, which a lot of astronomers are modeling exactly how this gravitational interaction occurs, but Jupiter is so big that it could fling comets almost out of the solar system. So even beyond where this disk of comets were born, there's a whole cloud, even tens of thousands of, you know, uh, billions of miles away, basically, where a bunch of comets exist. And again, a passing star, maybe slight shockwave from an old supernova or something can disrupt one of them, and they get captured by the sun. Well, they come in very high in the elliptical orbits. These are called long period comets. So if the um, eccentricity of their path is big, they'll come in once and exit the solar system and we'll never see them again. But sometimes they'll get captured and their orbit, orbit lifetime may be thousands of years. I think Hellbox is like 3,000 years. So this is huge elliptical orbit, and then that's why they call them long period comets. Instead of five years, you've got thousands of years as they're going. So those are the two main families. And then the third are these sun bracing comets. And so each of those comets, the short period, which sample this kind of disk called the Kuiper Belt, which formed outside of Jupiter, you can compare those with what comets look like from the ones that were ejected, and they, they, those come from what was called the, is called the Oort cloud. And those are Oort cloud comets that were studied. And you can compare and contrast the two different types of families because they sample different parts of the early solar nebula. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that Yes, yes, yes. They will always, once they start cooling down, they leave the main, the the uh, the main branch, right, and become super giants, or even giants, red giants. Sorry, they become red giants because as their nuclear burning starts to slow down, they start to cool and compensate. They have to expand, and it's just going to become cooler and redder as they do that. So yeah, all stars that leave the the main sequence will become some sort of red giant. Yeah. Excuse me, about uh, the, and I think there are comments. You say that, that they are like ice, but they are not on that side. So, can they, I think you mentioned about the thing that is the thing about the child, but you can go and just put that to the side that this water, because they are like ice, that they take the evaporates from them, and then they are destroyed. Are they destroyed? Mm -hmm. Well, some can be destroyed, right? Because you're wondering whether the, the ice might break apart, or I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. Um, I'm asking the comment, right? Now, 
A lot of them also develop a hard shell, especially the, uh, the short period ones that kind of protect them, and so you get specific vents. But they're not getting so close that they will be destroyed. It's only these special sun rays. Now, some can survive or fairly close. They can get down uh, maybe half an astronomical unit. And if they're big enough or if this is their first time through, it's still not close enough for them for all that ice to be destroyed. A lot of it is regulated because a lot of the, the dirt and dust that's mixed in there help keep it inside. And so that's why most of what you're seeing off come from vents rather than just this whole thing just being destroyed at one time. So sun raising ones, yeah, they're headed straight for the sun and they're not going to make it. But everything else kind of, when we talk about getting close to the sun, we're talking relatively close compared to how they usually are, which is much farther out, and that's where they stay cold. So when something starts getting in, say, right near Jupiter, about five astronomical units, we can see it start to boil off. Really, when it gets near Mars, about three astronomical units, then that real boiling really starts. And it's starting its activity, and it rises, and then it gets close to the around the orbit of the Earth, one astronomical unit, and then it'll travel back off, and all that will turn off, and then it goes back into the cold freeze again. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it, it depends. I mean, I think there's a big question of did our planets, you know, did we only form eight planets or maybe we had 20 planets at some point and then just through various collisions, uh, these planets were destroyed somehow. It's possible. Uh, I think there's a lot of models out there showing very different things. These asteroids could be remnants of planets that didn't survive. But I think that's just one idea, you know, corresponding to one model that, that might work. Um, they could also have formed, so there was what was called the snow line, and there's still something called the snow line, where everything inside of it, you're going to boil off all that water. You know, it's about, as I said, near the orbit of Jupiter. So anything that formed in there is probably not going to have ice, and so maybe all the asteroids point formed in there, whereas all the comets had formed farther out where ice could exist, where it just wasn't boiling off. So, it's a combination of maybe there are some planets that collided and didn't survive, or you're just forming, you know, these are the remnants of planet formation that are still sticking around. Yep. Um, I had that subject that I wanted to ask you about what's going on with the moon and the Saturn. Saturn, yeah. So, how do you have the Saturn? That is an excellent question. Unfortunately, that's not my area of expertise, but I think I was reading something. It would have to be, gravity is crazy. I'll say that right now. Given on long time scales, things that you think are in locked orbits really aren't. Because we think of the universe, you know, in our solar system is fairly static. But things were moving around all the time, back and forth. You know, there's all these different things that could have been moving around until now we're kind of kind of locked in these fairly circular orbits. It's similar to something even orbiting a planet. So the idea that there could have been maybe some moons that were around, but they moved in such chaotic orbits that they were always colliding with, uh, with each other, and then you get this cascading effect where you're making more material and you get more collisions until finally you just end up with this dust, ice, and debris field. Uh, the, you know, and that's me saying a lot without actually, you know, giving too many specifics because there's a lot of modeling, computer modeling out there to try to figure out because one of the more interesting things is how flat they are. You know, it's not this nice thick band material that you would think. And I don't think I've ever read a satisfactory answer why they're so thin. So I think the idea of this moon is, again, just one idea. It could have been something passing, maybe like a smaller, or an asteroid or a comet that could have been broken up as well. I mean, there's any number of ideas that might work, but there's still a lot of interest in, I don't think there's a quite definitive answer on how, on how sad it is actually formed. Yep. Uh, one of the things that I'm sorry. So, 
yeah, for me, I always knew I wanted to be do something in space. Uh, I've talked to people, you know, friends and colleagues who didn't necessarily have that same drive. I think maybe they were good at math and good at physics and kind of were drawn into astronomy. I know people who were in astronomy and they were like, no, this isn't for me either, and then went off and did something else. So I think every person's story is very different. You know, I think one of the main things I see common is that uh, even among science, scientists at all, is everybody has a love for math and especially in the physical sciences, uh, at least a love at first level for physics. You know, I kind of like physics, but uh, I'd rather be doing astronomy even though I do physics. You know, my degree is actually in physics, and so I'm able to apply my physics to astronomy, where other people, there's geologists, you know, as I said, there's geologists who are happy, you know, going around here and looking at rocks and stuff, are now doing geology on Mars. You know, it's that they're applying their skills uh, to other planets. There's biologists and chemists and things like that. And so astronomy is not just, you know, you don't just become an astronomer. You know, some people can if you're, if you're studying stars or something. Generally that's within, but you've got high energy physics as well. Um, binary stars that I didn't even talk about. I mean, there's whole other areas. So whether it's something inside you, I think what's inside you is a, a love for science and love for math and love for physics, and that can translate into any number of things. Uh, yeah, sorry, you. So that's true. Um, for the second part, um, 
Alien. So at this point, I do. I don't think there's any evidence that we've ever been visited by aliens or that aliens have ever come here. With that said, looking at the probability of just how big the universe is, how many stars, not only in our own galaxy, but just the amount of galaxies and so the amount of stars and the amount of planets. I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface to find the amount of planets even around other stars in our own galaxy. I think it gives a high likelihood that there should be life, and not just even microbial life or plant life, but intelligent life in other systems. And I think it would be great to be able to find evidence of such a thing, and I think the astronomers are always looking for that. You know, there was this whole thing back uh, in the 80s and 90s, the SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, where they were pointing radio telescopes, you know, these big antennas, these big dish antennas at different systems, trying to find any evidence of intelligent life. And uh, I think that's still an ongoing thing that, you know, we would hold out hope that, uh, but given just the high likelihood, just the numbers alone, there should be intelligent life out there. Yep. Um, No, we mostly see just regular stars on the main sequence, just in the middle of their life. I mean, that when we look at the stars, they're just basically stars just burning their nuclear fuel. Neutron stars are we won't you don't really see those uh, with the naked eye. They're since they're older, they tend to be much farther away, so we wouldn't see them. White dwarfs as well, very very faint, so we wouldn't necessarily see those with the naked eye. You know, they still show up if you look through a telescope and know where to look, but you're not going to really see those as you sit here and kind of gaze at the night sky. So, we, you might see some red giants. I think there's a star in Orion called Betelgeuse that is a red giant star. And so, anything that's reddish that's not Mars uh, is most likely on its way or is a red giant star. And then you can see kind of these other bluish stars. Anything that's blue is really, really hot, so it's most likely a big, massive star. But anything that's just like a normal star, like our star, it's just in the middle of its life, just kind of happily burning away. And so that's what mostly, for the majority, you're going to see in the next So the laser of the first next day, is what you see. Yeah, we see most in the middle stage. And the, the, end, the end of the life cycle there it happens relatively quickly. And mostly those stages you have to see with the telescope. Even planetary nebula are fairly faint as well because it's mostly kind of this fuzzy dot. And so it's not a nice, intense, burning bright star. The, the, the star is comparatively, during its lifetime, you know, when it's happy burning fuel, is the brightest thing. That's the brightest it's going to be in its life. And so that's what you're missing. Uh, yeah. Thank you, David. Now, there's going to be a, another rover in 2020 
And I think they're going to try to equip it with instruments that actually can work for life science, or at least ancient life science. So yeah, it has done mineral analysis. There's uh, two instruments on it. One is called ChemCam up on the mast, and it shoots a laser at the rock to create this plume where it then measures the uh, emission from the plume and actually can do a mineralogical analysis. And then, as I showed, when they take the drill, they take the sample and put it inside. There's an instrument on the deck of the rover called SAM. It's um, a gas chromatograph where it actually splits all the dirt and, and rock into its various elements and they can do an analysis that way. So that's how they've basically been determining what all the minerals are. A uh, second one, I've already forgotten. So it was about um, what are the research areas funded to make change to that? Oh research areas. So a lot of the people on that project are geologists. And so there's a whole area of planetary geology. And they, uh, some of them are, you know, started as geologists on Earth here, and I think that's where they got a lot of their training. And they've gone off and studied, especially Mars. There's a lot of Mars geologists where they're trying to understand, because there, we have so many great pictures of Mars, and it's such a geologically rich environment that a lot of the scientists here actually are uh, that's all they study is Mars geology. And so it's essentially planetary geology is the area. And then job opportunities. So if you want to do astronomy and have your own research area, you know, you found something you're interested in and you want to pursue it, you really need a PhD level of education. Um, my, one of my thesis advisors, she said basically the PhD is your license to practice astronomy. There are a few out there who have masters, but they're not really doing research. Maybe they work in an institution in a support capacity or in an observatory, like I showed. You know, there's plenty of people who work in observatories who operate the telescopes, but they're not really doing research. But you know, they're interested in astronomy and they get to play with telescopes and things like that. But if you really want to do the real intense research, you have to have a PhD level. Now, the jobs that are out there, it's it can be tight. Um, if you want to work at a university in a tenure track position, you'll become a professor. Those jobs are very few and far between. I don't even have one of those jobs. Uh, I'm a research scientist, which means I work at a university, but I bring in my own research money. So I write to NASA and the American National Science Foundation, and I say, here's the science I want to do. Here's my budget. Please pay me, because my science is more important than anybody else's. All these other people are horrible, but I do great work. And so then they say, hey, of course you're right. And then they send me the money and I have a research project. And then I spend all my time doing research. And so research scientists are a little bit more common. And then there's smaller schools, um, colleges, where you might do a little more teaching, but you still have room for science. So you might teach more than, you, than, than not. Outside of academics, there are private institutions. You know, maybe they build satellites and things like that. So maybe on the side, you and say, okay, I have to spend 50% of my time working on building a satellite, and maybe this other part I can work on my global science project, and I know people like that as well. So there's a variety of, of jobs out there, but really, you know, it all starts with getting that PhD so you can say, I've got the training, I'm ready to go, you know, here's what I'm going to do. Sort of. Yep. I want to know how much cosmology, how much the physics Oh, that's a hard question. Um, I don't even know how to make an answer that. That is a tough question because many, many, many years ago I was going to get into cosmology and I just decided it wasn't for me. You know, and you bounce around between different topics, but for the part of physics, I mean, that is a tough question. That is the hardest question I've had since I'm here. So, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> you win. Um, yeah, I really don't know how to answer that. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything I can say to you, but... Or even where to start looking. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think you stopped me. Yeah. So, you know, cosmology, again, is one of those areas that it, there's a variety 
because there are those who just sit there modeling. You would have to know quite a bit of particle physics, I think, if you were to say you're trying to build a model of what happens during the first few seconds of the universe. I mean, you're breaking down a lot of the natural laws of the universe, you know, in those first few milliseconds of, of what happened right after the Big Bang. And I think that's where a lot of your particle physics is going to be. Then there's kind of the, the observers who look at the cosmic background radiation, which is the radiation left over from the Big Bang itself. And they're always, that's called less particle physics involved there. You're mostly looking and analyzing uh, incongruities in the, in the background radiation and say, okay, this is how these inconsistencies could have developed matter. Now, how much particle physics there you need, I'm not as quite sure, but uh, I'm sorry my answer can't be, can't be much better. Not all, not strictly. No, I don't think so. I think you're, it's also looking at, like, they're looking at really, really old galaxies. So you're even part of the observational part. I think to say a couple months ago, a few months ago, they found the oldest galaxy I think they had ever observed. It was like, you know, the universe is 13.7 billion years old. This galaxy was like 13 billion years old. I mean, it was really old. So you're not just looking at that. You're also, you know, you can analyze that galaxy and try to get, you can look at the galaxy and get a rough idea of the mineral abundance inside of it, right? It should be mostly hydrogen, which is what most of the universe is made of. And maybe some helium. And because all the heavier elements came later because they had to be produced inside stars. Stars are what produced the heavier elements. Everything we see around us was came from a star at some point because the universe didn't make it. The universe just made hydrogen and helium, maybe some of the tiny bits. And then it was these factories, these stellar factories that built everything. So as you, if you look at the back of these really old galaxies and try to come up with chemical abundances, and it should conform to the theory, that it should be mostly in the So, you know, particle physics is way outside my, <laughs> that's like old history to me, that kind of that. So, um, I don't know if I'm answering your question very well, but. <laughs>
know, some of us started here and we live with, you know, never see someone from other place to present. And we've uh, got an opportunity and she's from the embassy. So I don't know whether we should, uh, I will make sure that we put down the hands and then I will send you the this. And then uh, this is what I think of them try to write to you.